In previous episodes, Kelsey explained how you could crack RSA encryption with an algorithm capable of quickly factoring ginormous numbers into primes. Now that might give you the impression that fast factoring algorithms would compromise all digital security, but not so. For instance, YouTube's encryption of this video would be unaffected. And that's because the essence of encryption isn't really about factoring or prime numbers per se. So what is it about? Internet communications between Alice and Bob are visible to eavesdroppers, like Eve, who have access to the intermediary computers that relay internet traffic. That's why Alice and Bob encrypt communications, so that their messages won't be understood by others even when they're seen by others. How can Alice and Bob do that? In the next few episodes, we'll discuss some different ways they can exchange information securely, along with their pros and cons. There's some cool math underlying many of these methods, and we're gonna work our way up to it. But before we do, I think it's important to clarify how cryptography actually operates, at least at a flowchart level. Because as you'll see, you can achieve essentially unbreakable encryption without any esoteric mathematics. And I think seeing how that works first will furnish crucial context for understanding why fancier stuff, like finite fields and cyclic groups, need to come into play at all. So let's start with some cryptography 101. To send encrypted communications, Alice and Bob could concoct some private scheme for converting plain text to and from ciphertext, but how would they know that scheme is actually secure? I mean, designing crypto systems is hard, and quantifying their resistance to attacks is even harder. A clever eavesdropper might well expose a flaw in the system that Alice and Bob never anticipated. As a practical matter, the only way to really build confidence in any encryption scheme is to allow experts to scrutinize it. But this seems to create a catch-22. To serve its purpose, the details of an encryption scheme must be kept secret. But to spot the vulnerabilities in that scheme, you need to make those details public. The modern solution to this problem comes in the form of what are called key-based cryptographic protocols. Alice and Bob agree on a number called the key, usually big, often random, but with some constraints that might depend on the specifics of the protocol they use. To encrypt a message to Bob, Alice mixes it with the key and scrambles the results according to a prescribed procedure. To decrypt the ciphertext, Bob then runs it through a related set of procedures that will spit out garbage unless he mixes in the same key. Crypto schemes like this are called symmetric key systems because they use the same key at both ends. And they allow us to have our cryptographic cake and eat it too. On the one hand, their security properties are well vetted because the algorithms are public and thus analyzed to death. On the other, because they also require a secret ingredient, the key, each time they're used, these schemes are de facto private. One of the most widespread and most robust symmetric key protocols is called the Advanced Encryption Standard, or AES. It's used by both the US federal government and private companies, including YouTube. And guess what? Under the hood, AES has nothing to do with factoring huge numbers, or with prime factors, or with any of the sexier math you often hear discussed in popular treatments of encryption. That's not to say that AES isn't based on interesting math, it is. But conceptually speaking, it's pretty basic, which is a big part of why it was selected by NIST in the first place as the US encryption standard for the 21st century. Crudely speaking, all AES does is multiple rounds of shuffling, swapping, and scrambling that end up looking random and that are ridiculously hard to undo without knowing the original key. Here's a rough analogy. Imagine that Alice has a deck of cards arranged in some meaningful order that she wants to send to Bob. She cuts the deck in half and shuffles the halves together according to some rule. Maybe one from the left, then two from the right, then three from the left, then two more from the right, then back to one from the left, and so forth. Now she shuffles the deck like this 100 times and hands the scrambled deck to Eve. Even if Eve knew that 100 rounds of shuffling had taken place, it would be a nightmare to recover the original card sequence unless she also knew the shuffling rule so that she could apply it in reverse. AES is more elaborate than this, but it operates on a similar principle. The 1232 rule in our example plays the role of the secret key. And the protocol of doing 100 rounds with whatever shuffling rule was chosen, that's analogous to the public algorithm. It sounds simple, right? Well, this combo of partially predetermined and partially improvised shuffling actually turns out to be enormously powerful because the only fundamental attack against it is to guess the key by trial and error. And unfortunately for Eve, the number of possibilities she has to try grows exponentially with the number of digits in the key. 
So pick a key with enough digits, and Eve would need many times the age of the universe to have a reasonable chance of guessing correctly. And that's even if she had every computer that's ever existed working together on only that problem. Granted, people do sometimes devise clever attacks against symmetric encryption schemes, but these attacks typically exploit flaws in implementation rather than in the protocol itself. In the interest of completeness, I should state that a few years ago, some researchers discovered an attack against AES that is slightly better than brute force guessing, and which does reduce the cracking time to only a few trillion years. The bottom line is that AES and its symmetric key brethren are practically bulletproof. Moreover, the nature of the internal steps makes them particularly easy to hardwire into chips, so these schemes are also super fast. And this is why symmetric encryption is the workhorse of modern cryptography. Almost everything that you send or receive via the internet is directly encoded in this way. And even if tomorrow Eve discovered a new algorithm for quickly factoring huge numbers, that wouldn't directly compromise AES one iota. Now, I know what you're thinking. If all of this is true, then why is everyone always like RSA this and prime numbers that? I mean, if symmetric encryption is really so unbreakable, why bother with anything else? Well, you may have already noticed that symmetric encryption does have an Achilles heel, and it's not mathematical in nature. If you haven't noticed it yet, I'll let you reflect on what that might be for a while. At least until our next episode. That's when we'll explore why symmetric cryptography alone doesn't cut it, and how alternate schemes, including the famous RSA, try to do better. I'll see you next time. Hey everyone, Ty Danae here. I want to respond to some of your comments from my previous episode, Associahedra, The Shapes of Multiplication. So, first things first. Word on the street is, I talk a little fast. Don't worry, I heard you loud and clear. Funny thing is, before we started filming the episodes, I was told to talk faster to keep the pacing up. But thanks to your feedback, we now know that you feel, and rightly so, that the math is far too wonderful to let it whiz by. So don't worry, I plan to slow down. All right, next up, at the end of the episode, I asked you to ponder why loop concatenation is not commutative. Several of you, like Pika250, had the right idea. In the product A times B, the red car starts driving around its loop first, then the blue car goes. But in B times A, the blue car starts driving first, then the red goes. Since these aren't the same, A times B is not equal to B times A, and so loop concatenation is not commutative. Next, Jacob Spear asked a great question. Why aren't there edges between every pair of vertices on an isosahedron? For example, why do we get a pentagon instead of a complete graph on five vertices? Great question. If you were to look back at the pentagon shown in that episode, around five minutes and two seconds, you'll notice that there is an edge between the top vertex and the leftmost vertex. That's because we can get from one configuration of parentheses to another in exactly one move. Shift the internal parentheses from AB to BC. But there is no edge from the top vertex to the bottom left. That's because getting from the top configuration to the one on the bottom left requires more than one move. First, we would have to shift the internal parentheses from AB to BC, as before. But then we would have to move the outside set of parentheses from ABC to BCD. Because this requires two moves, we do not draw an edge between the top and bottom left vertices. Lastly, Duncan Coulter made a cool observation about some advanced math. This idea of paths between paths between paths may remind some of you of the progression from categories to functors to natural transformations and so on. And rightly so. This infinite string of paths between paths is precisely the idea that underlies infinity categories. So, a narco who said, don't think we don't see you trying to sneak in higher category theory, lol. Well, I'm guilty as charged, lol. See you next time.